warfare festered in a bit of Victorian scandal mixed in with some history. Well, buckle up for this week's video as we declare culinary warfare, 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 warfare. Hi guys, welcome to this week's video. I thought I would switch things up and give you a Mrs. Beaton history lesson and let you know why some people love her and others, well, loathe her, loathe her. If you like this video, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and hit that alarm bell so that you get notified. Now, let's get started. So, before we start with Mrs. Beaton, we have to shimmy back in history a few years to the time of Eliza Acton. Who is Eliza Acton, I hear you say? Well. According to Delia, only the best cookery writer in the English language. That is praise indeed from Queen Delia. Let's sidestep for some Victorian contacts. Now, the Victorians were bougie with food. They liked it fancy and were keen on stepping up in the world. Rich households employed male chefs to create fancy, fancy culinary delights. These would have been trained in France and would have been mega fancy, mega bougie, mega high maintenance and mega expensive. Other well-to-do households, such as Audley End and Essex, employed cooks like Mrs. Crocombe, who would have been at the tippity top of her game. To get anywhere in polite society, you needed staff and excellent food. But what happens if you didn't have the staff? In walks Eliza Acton. Eliza was born on the 17th of April 1799 in Sussex. She was the oldest of nine children and her father worked for a brewery. To all intents and purposes, it looked like Eliza had a fairly good middle-class upbringing, with her father rising through the ranks to become a partner in the brewery. Yay! She wrote and published poetry and opened and ran a girls' boarding school. She was pretty clever and she knew what she was doing. She spent some time in France. Rumour has it that the time in France was not exactly a holiday, and she actually went to give birth to an illegitimate child. See? I told you there would be scandal. That, however, is sadly just a rumour, and all that we know for sure is that she travelled for her health. She, however, returned to England, brimming with culinary knowledge and a few more poems, and got straight to work. In 1845, she published her first and possibly the best cookery book ever, Modern Cookery for Private Families, or, to give it its full title, excuse me while I get in focus for this, Modern Cookery, in all its branches, reduced to a system of easy practice, for the use of private families in a series of practical receipts which have been strictly tested and given with the most minute exactness. Yeah. Hail Queen Eliza, you no longer needed a cook. She told you how to do it yourself and in such great detail. This book was such a success that it remained in print until 1918 and brought us the delights we know today of Brussels sprouts, spaghetti and Christmas pudding. Can you imagine not having spaghetti? It's fair to say that Eliza was a rock star in the culinary world. Her book was republished in 1994 and many modern chefs, including Rick Stein, are still using her techniques and singing her praises. In 1857, she followed up with a second book entitled The English Bread Book for Domestic Use, again showing you how to do it yourself or gift it to your domestic to um, help them along. Yeah. yeah. She passed away two years later from complications relating to dementia on the 13th of February, 1859. Sad times. That's great, Jess. Eliza was cool, but we're here for beaten and some more scandal. Okay. Okay, okay. I'm coming to that now. Give me a second. Isabella Mason was born on the 14th of March 1836 in Marleybone, London. She was the oldest of three daughters to Benjamin Mason, a linen merchant. Shortly after Isabella's birth, the family moved to Milk Street, Cheapside, from where Benjamin traded. Sadly, Isabella's father died just four years later. Her mother, struggling to raise a family and run her father's business, sent Isabella to live with her grandfather in Cumberland, although she returned to her mother just two years later. In 1851, Isabella was sent to school in Heidelberg, Germany. Isabella became proficient in the piano and excelled in French and German. She also gained knowledge and experience of making pastry. She had returned to Epsom by the summer of 1854, where she took further pastry lessons from a local baker. So Isabella was pretty smart and a talented baker in her own right. 
1855, she married Samuel Orchard Beaton, who was rather a cool dude. He was a publisher and a discreet but firm believer in the equality of women and their relationship, both personal and professional, was an equal partnership. Round of applause for being a great guy. Right? Shortly into their marriage, Samuel persuaded Isabella to join forces and contribute to his magazine, The English Woman's Domestic Magazine. It was affordable and aimed at young middle class women and became very successful, helping to teach many a young woman how to properly conduct oneself and run a home. Isabella asked her readership to send in recipes to be used in the publication, to which she received over 2,000 responses, which she used with gay abandon and without accrediting any of the authors. Smooth, Isabella. Smooth. I thought you were supposed to be a classy lady. However, she does redeem herself slightly. Whilst happily plagiarising other writers' works, she made a giant leap in the receipt writing world. Traditionally, recipes were written with the recipe how to at the top and the ingredients at the bottom. She, however, flipped it on its head and put the rest the ingredients at the top and the method at the bottom, turning it into the recipes that we know today. Also, handily for her readership, she costed out all of the ingredients. Nicely redeemed, Beaton. Nicely redeemed. She was also charitable. During the particularly bitter winter of 1858 to 1859, Beaton prepared her own soup that she served to the poor of Pinner. Soup for benevolent purposes. The recipe would become the only entry in her book of household management that was her own. Yeah, that is correct. In 1861, the Beatons published Mrs. Beaton's book of household management. Yay! Now, in the interest of celebrating its awesomeness first, let's start with how cool this book actually was. It became one of the major publishing events of the 19th century. Beaton included a 26-page analytical index in the book, considered to be fabulously detailed and exhaustively cross-referenced. The book provided advice on fashion, childcare, animal husbandry, poisons, the management of servants, science, religion, first aid, and the importance in the use of local seasonal produce. In the first year of publication, the book sold 60,000 copies, and it reflected Victorian values, particularly hard work, thrift, and cleanliness. It is hailed as being the optimistic message that mid-Victorian England was filled with opportunities for those who were willing to learn how to take advantage of them, and that one can understand its success if young ladies who knew nothing of domestic arrangements no better book than this could have been devised for them. Now, of the 1,112 pages, let's move on to the 900 pages of recipes and some scandal! Only one of those recipes was hers. Just one, just one. A side step for context. Most Victorian writers and cookbooks included recipes from a variety of sources. However, these would have been tweaked by the writer as they were tested and put their own stamp on them and attributed to the original source. This, however, was not beaten style. Nope, she just copied away and did not attribute any of her sources. One major source was the dearly departed Eliza Acton. And this, my friends, is why Beaton comes under such fire. How dare she plagiarise such an English treasure and beloved cookery writer as Eliza Acton. Harsh. How dare she. Sadly, on the 6th of February, 1865, at the age of just 28, Isabella died of puerperal fever. The cause of death was given as apoplexy, which covers a range of ailments, including those attributed to syphilis which she is believed to have contacted from her husband, who now feels like less of a great guy. I retract that earlier round of applause. Also, what's going on? Continuing to shine himself in an excellent light, he covered up the news of his wife's death and sold the rights of the book to Ward, Block and Tyler, who continued in the cover-up so that they could publish more plagiarised recipes in Beaton's name. Good old classy scandalous Victorian in my heart for Eliza Acton. She was a pioneer and quite frankly rather awesome, but I would have never heard of her if it wasn't for Mrs Beaton, which I think is sad and may just be unique to my uneducated situation. 
And whilst I'm mad at Isabella for her blatant plagiarism of others' recipes, she was still a formidable woman.